I'm a person of many identities, and it's true that I have, uh, in the late last years, concentrated on the whole issue of the Jewish presence in Europe. But I'm also someone who studied the Fra France, Italy, and having lived and studied in the United States, also different countries, different identities, different moments. Let me begin, when, I, when Lena asked me to write, to think of something to speak about, as a historian, I immediately thought of one thing, which was, in the past year of 2017, we witnessed across the world how one was to commemorate or remember or think about the great October Revolution of 1917. And this particular moment was perceived as a sort of internal reflection for practically every Western country as to what had happened, how it had affected others. And all of a sudden, we realized that for most Russians, and certainly also for the powers in power, those in power, if they could have gotten rid of the date of November 7th, it would have been perhaps very pleasant to skip it over. And so I thought I would not speak to you about the Russian Revolution. This is your personal domain, and I'm not a specialist of Russian history, although I have studied it at length. Try to put this particular moment in the context of two other world historical events that took place, some ending and others not, that could give you a kind of longer perspective on the whole issue of what you can do with a world historical event and how long does it take for it to be digested. First of all, a little anecdote. My friendship with Lena does not begin with the Moscow School. Lena was my Russian advisor and correspondent for a pan-European review I edited out of Paris in 1990, 91, and 92. And I shall not forget that on November 7th, 1991, I was walking in the streets of Moscow, going to Red Square to witness the first ever moment in which there was no parade and no official commemoration of the Soviet Revolution. I shall not forget the moment in which, with great surprise, everyone was strolling and in the Russian tradition, which seems for me the Italian quite amazing, eating ice cream on November 7th. Walking with balloons on Red Square, where the whole world had been used to the idea that on that very day, the entire Politburo would sit atop the Lenin Memorial, the Lenin Mausoleum, and the Sovietologists would choose and look to see who was to the right of, to the left of, and there was nothing there. Silence, a vacuum of history, people strolling, the militia not wearing arms, in a kind of suspended historical moment, the likes of which happen very, very seldom in world history. So I was privy of that particular moment. And I remember standing there saying, well, what on earth is going to happen? Maybe peace will occur. This is it. It's over. And when I said it's over, in my own mind, constructed as I was with massive amounts of French history, I said to myself, well, this means that the French Revolution is over, two centuries later. And indeed, I have made arguments in lectures that the French Revolution ended the day the Soviet flag was lowered from the top of the Kremlin. And so in this perspective of the French Revolution on one end, the Russian Revolution on the other, and a third element which you might consider to be strange and not appropriate, but I will try to show you why, the Holocaust in 20th century history, are three moments in which you can ponder the strange title I gave to this presentation, which is forgetting, remembering, commemorating, but in which order. And I will try to show to you that really these three terms, and I purposefully put as a paradox, forgetting before remembering, are words that you can compare in terms of mathematical topology to a Möbius strip. In other words, it's still one continuum, but it bends and it goes under and it comes up again. Or if you prefer another metaphor, think of an accordion player. 
moving in and out the sounds. There are moments in which the bellows are completely open, moments in which they're closed, narrow spots, very large spots. And I think we have to think of history in such a term. Now, uh, my first word to you would be, well, you did not celebrate the 100th anniversary of 1917. <clears throat> the ghosts are still there, and perhaps, like the French Revolution, it will take another century for it to be fully digested by the Russian elites and the Russian people. Perhaps, because here is an element I would like to stress, and it's one of the, the things I would like to address. <clears throat> is it the same thing to be <clears throat> forgetting, remembering, commemorating, remembering, commemorating, forgetting, commemorating, forgetting, and remembering in pluralist democratic societies and in societies where there is an authoritarian element in which the past is not open but still controlled for all sorts of reasons that can be political, social, or cultural. And I leave this question open to you because in the very long term, you must understand, if you look at the French Revolution, that there were moments in which <clears throat> July 14th, the Bastille, 1789, were absent, repressed, commemorated, still turned into something else. It is still France's powerful national holiday, the one Trump admired so much because he could see the full military parade and said, ooh, I would like to have that on Pennsylvania Avenue myself, without understanding that countries have a past and you could not put the American military forces on parade in the same manner. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what I'm trying to say here is we're in suspended judgment, like I was walking on Red Square on that November 7th, 1991. It is too early to form full-fledged understandings of what you are trans living through your understanding and relationship to the Russian Revolution. So for first of all, three things. Um, I'm speaking here about the Western world. I dare not include in what I'm saying anything about Asia. There have been prominent and important books, for instance, by Ian Uburuma, stressing the fact that the Asian understanding of time, of guilt, of commemoration, are quite different from ours. So, Please take this humbly as a very much of a Western story, and I put in the Western story Russia as well. Because, as Dominic Moisey said yesterday, Russia is not quite Asia. It may play with both, but in terms of history, the past, philosophy, and understanding of time, it is very much a part of the West. So, um, how could I uh, make this sound understandable. I've been thinking about this uh, for quite a while, but it's really for you that I produced this presentation. And I would like to say, well, how do you begin? Uh, where is the moment? So there is, of course, the event. In Russian Soviet history, it was, of course, the storming of the Winter Palace after the firing of the guns of the Aurora. In France, it was the taking of the Bastille. There is no event as such for the Holocaust, and I'll come back to that later. So the first element, I'm going to give you a series of conceptual terms, and then we can discuss more the given identities of each moment. What happened to those who lived through it? How many were on the victorious side who told the story? Who remained in the same place? In other words, commemorating, forgetting, and remembering does imply that the same people are around. And you can very well imagine that this would not pertain to the Holocaust, where the six million who died left Eastern Europe practically without Jews. But for the French and for the Russians, even more for the French than for the Russians, it's the same story with the same people throughout. How many were thrown out into exile? How many died? Who returned? And what place did they have in the society afterwards? And this is what makes the French Revolution very interesting because everyone returned, everyone has been around, and everyone has had his or her piece of the pie. Less so with the Russian Revolution, of course. The absence of commemoration, uh, well, it took a while. The second question I would like to just evoke, 
And this is not a summary in which I will go through all the issues again in greater detail. They are just elements, one after the other. Is the question of numbers. Does it matter? Are numbers important in understanding and commemorating, forgetting and remembering a great historical event? If you realize by the scale of the Russian comparison that at the entire French terror killed 20,000, that another 250,000 were killed in the counter-revolutionary uh, reaction of the French state, of the Comité de Sûreté Publique, against the Chouan of Western France in what has been termed perhaps the first modern genocide since it was directed at very Catholic, very Ancien Regime forces. So it's very little. There were six million dead among the Jews, but what about the Russians? If you take the Russian Revolution, the Civil War, and without even entering necessarily into the years of the Gulag, you're already reaching millions, 40, 50, 60 million Russians. Consequently, the scale among these three world historical events cannot be measured. Numbers may not actually make the difference, perhaps only in the issue of forgetting. Then comes the third element, which is the question of dating of the event. When does it begin? When does it end? Who takes what piece of the pie? For instance, for the French Revolution, did it begin in 1789 or did it begin with the nobles' revolt in the Parliament of Rennes in 1788? Did it go on until 1791? That's the constitutional monarchy. 1792, the coming to power. 1793, the execution of the king. 1794, the end of Thermidor, with Thermidor, the end of the terror. Or, most likely, as people say today, 1799, with the coming to power of Bonaparte. Not yet Napoleon, but Bonaparte, the general. What does, how does it begin and where does it end for the Russian Revolution? Is it really the 1905, the February moment of 1917? Is it the storming of the Bolshevik takeover? Does it end in 2021 with Kronstadt and the repression of the Navy? Does it end with Lenin's death in 1924? Does it end with some people who have said this whole moment ends with 1928 and Stalin's coming to power and the new industrializing phase? plus everything else. Does it end for the Jewish story? Does it really begin in 1933 with Hitler's coming to power? Does it begin in 1942 with the, the solution, the final solution being proclaimed at Wannsee for the extermination? Does it end in 45 with the end of World War II? Does it end in 46 when you still have pogroms in Poland after the Jews return? Does it end in 1948 for those who see the state of Israel as the final culmination of the long Jewish story or not? Does it end at all? We do not know. So uh, this is an issue of the dating of events. Then there is an issue of the question of blocks, and it would be my fourth point. Can one pick and choose with time across these major events saying, oh, I stop in 1791 and I won't go beyond? Or I really would have preferred if I could have hung around with Kerensky and consolidated. Or could one say in a Jewish context which would have been, well, we could have been kicked out of Germany and that in itself would not have been the beginning of the extermination. Can one pick and choose? As late as 1917, and of course the arrival of the Soviet Revolution was crucial for the recharging of the motor of the French Revolution, even before, for someone like Clemenceau, the prime minister, the statement was, la révolution est un bloc. You cannot pick and choose. You have to take it all. Is this true? It is no longer true in France. As I made the point before, the French Revolution ended in 1991. Uh, can you take it and leave it? Who, who is there to argue about it? That is another question. Are all the forces still around? In the French case, yes. In the Russian case, not clear. I don't know. I remember many years ago in one of the seminars of the school 
at the Council of Europe, there were many people around, and I said quite, I wanted to know who the students were, and I said, you know, if this were a group of Americans or Europeans, I would simply say, please go around the table and tell me who you are and where you come from, but I know that you come from Russia, and the issue of who you are, where you come from, your family, and so forth is delicate, and you may not wish to speak about it. So I respect, is anyone willing? And I got an incredible amount of replies. I am the child of an officer who was in Berlin for the building of the wall. I'm from Siberia, and I never thought that people would think that I also belonged in Versailles. They had just visited. And one lonely man stood up and said, my grandfather was a Menshevik. And silence, complete silence ensued. It was as though he had produced the taboo word, a Menshevik someone who still remembered that the grandfather was a Menshevik. What did it mean for the Russia of 1996 or 97 when it was that the conference took place? So this is a question. As you rethink the Russian revolution and its past, how many of the actors are still there in terms of political cleavages, political analyses? And I would like to say this in a kind of strange manner, but the Holocaust does not quite enter into this element, but it does in a way, because the whole, there was a whole world of pre-Holocaust Jewry that had divisions and tensions, who hated the Zionists, loved the Zionists, and as long as Israel's fate is still up in the air, one does not really know what all the issues and what all the identities are, and whether some can be reborn. So in the question of, the question of blocks, does the coup d'etat of the Bolshevik Revolution mean that everything else was wiped out? Or slowly but surely, as different formations occur in Russia in the years to come, pieces of those puzzle will come back to life? I, of course, do not know, and perhaps you don't either. Then, the, um, to move beyond, after the question of blocks, you have a fifth point, which is remembering. Who does the remembering and what is remembered? Does one remember the event, the glory, or the chaos after the event? And above all, the distinction between personal remembering, collective remembering, and the remembering ex post facto of a situation that is still fluid. Then there is another element that is new to this century and did not exist really for the French Revolution. It's new to the Russian Revolution. And I would call this the fictionalization, the fictionalization of the event. The day the Bastille was taken, in the diary of King Louis XVI, there was simply rien, nothing, because it was his hunting diary and he hadn't caught anything on that particular day. But the symbol of the rien, nothing, for July 14, 1789, took on a greater significance with time, as you can imagine. We all know what Eisenstein made of the Bolshevik revolution, so that in our collective images, we confuse the moment with his film rendition of it. The forces beyond the individuals. Does the eyewitness matter? There were writers, but no journalists, and I know most of you are journalists. I always try to imagine what CNN or the BBC would have done having a... <clears throat> and does it matter? The Arab, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the Arab revolutions of the spring of 2011 especially the ones in Tahrir Square in Egypt, were fully covered by Facebook, Gmail, Google, Twitter, whatever you call. And everyone assumed that because they were electronically instantaneously available to all, it would change the course of history. Of course, nothing of that nature happened. The electronic things were merely bzz, sounds in the air. History has a way of moving on its own. So the sixth point will be the importance of forgetting. We all human beings must forget. We have to remember, but if we don't forget, we would die. Our brains would fall apart. 
Our pains will be eternal. Societies like human beings need to forget. History forgets as much as it remembers. So what is this important of forgetting? Does one need to forget to move on positively toward the future? Yes. Does one forget in personal terms? Yes, it's crucial. Must, however, societies learn not to forget collectively to move forward in a more humane and open manner? I would argue, yes. The burying of the pain does not mean that one should not confront the horror sooner or later. You forget for two reasons, either because things become more horrible afterwards, and you can make that claim for the Russian situation, as well as for the French for those few years of the terror, or because things become better. And it has been done a lot of research that many of the Holocaust survivors forgot or refused to talk about it because they moved on into a new world, a new life, and reconstructed itineraries. There's a crucial difference between personal silence and national silence. Private silence and public silence. And for me, what is important is that if the silence is vital for individuals, at some point for a collective, it cannot endure. And the silence is something that then has to be defined between two types of situations. The repressed and those who were the victims and those who took power can continue to live together or not. In the case of the French Revolution, those who suffered and those who did not and took power continued to live. Even most of the nobility returned to France after the uh, end of the Napoleonic Wars, after 1815. If you look in contemporary terms of the genocide in Rwanda, the Tutsis and the Houthis continue to live together. Not always well, but they do. If you take a look at the Holocaust for the eastern part of Europe, there's been precious co little coexistence. Survivors moved for the greater part to Israel, and the Western European Jews were too small to make a major statement of that nature, but they returned because it was a new world. It being a new world, it was a new rules of the game, and they were welcomed back into the fold. But when you think about oblivion, and I had just read recently a wonderful novel by a young Russian writer named Sergei Lebedev, whose title in English is Oblivion, and you realize that for him as a child, the 1990s, that moment in which I stood on Red Square in 1991, is already part of a history that isn't his anymore. So you have this notion of remembering, forgetting, oblivion, taking on in a spiral way through the ages, and even what I still consider to be hot memory for me, probably not for you, you were too young then, is already part of a past that gets lumped far away. So we move on to the seventh issue. What is the nature of the second remembering? I'm sort of provocatively using this in terms of the second coming. There is something biological, historical, about what we could call 40 years in the desert, the old biblical story about the Jews with Moses before they arrived in the Promised Land after having left Egypt. There is something almost biological or historical in this notion of the 40 years. If you relook at the past, and I'm here I'm looking at the French Revolution, 40 years brings you to 18... Uh, 29, 1830. And that's exactly when the end of the counter-revolution that followed the revolution takes place. With 1830, you enter the July monarchy. The July monarchy is perhaps what people had wanted in 1791 and didn't get. So it's an unfolding backward. From there, you move on to 1848 and the social struggles. Then you get one more element as a sort of farce, as Marx said. The second time tragedy is farce. Napoleon III is opposed to Napoleon I. And then you reach the hundredth years of the French Revolution, and you have the triumphant Third Republic. And those of you who have gone to Paris can see the symbols of this particular commemoration living in the crucial squares of France, which are 
Place de la République, where you have the Republic triumphant, or the genius of the Bastille, precisely where the Bastille fortress used to be. These are commemorations in stones 100 years after. And you can say, well, perhaps in the Russian case, the commemoration shouldn't be so much putting up new stones, but perhaps by, eight, nine, by 2024, taking uh, Tovarich Lenin and burying him. So each country has its own moment, its own rhythm. We do not know, but for sure something will be happening in the years to come. And in this particular issue of the remembering, you have to understand that who is doing this remembering? It's not the same people who did the actual remembering because they were living there at that point. So it's already a filtered through remembering. And oddly enough, the interesting thing about the revolution is that after it had been erected in stone, the commemoration of 1889, it would have slowly dwindled away in some kind of forgetfulness or historical penetration, were it not for you, you of course being Russia, and the Soviet Revolution, which charged up the batteries of the French Revolution and gave it an entire new breath that lasted from 1917 to 1991. So that there is a twinning there, because what was perceived to be, well, the end and the bourgeoisie triumphant with the working classes, it was assumed that the old Marxist analysis was going to be true. And until the working class and the proletariat reached power, that revolution had not ended either. And by the 1970s and all the way up to 1901, there was still this notion in the intelligentsia, as Lena mentioned, that the revolution had to go on because the proletariat had not come to power yet in a country like France. Now, uh, the nature of this remembering and the dates that are turning points, does it become important that it becomes stereophonic? Because the remembering and the immediate commemoration are generally monophonic, the ones who won. The second time around, do you get stereophonic sounds? And you could say yes, slowly but surely, you integrate more voices, more parallels, more references. And then comes the issue of quite different from remembering that follows, which is that of commemoration. Winners, losers, silence, who commemorates? From above or from below? If it's from above, is it from a country and a governing class that really wishes to take in all the different memories, that wishes to distort them or use them for its own ends? Is it commemorating because it has to, which could be the case of Germany with respect to the Holocaust? Is it commemorating because it wants to? Is it commemorating because, uh, well, historians get their 10 minutes of limelight at a given point? What is behind that? And then inside this commemoration, you have a very complex category, which is that of partial commemoration or wrong commemoration or insufficient commemoration. Certainly the way the Soviet line of commemorating took place about the fascists and the anti-fascists left much to be desired and certainly with respect to the Holocaust and the specificity of what happened to the Jews inside the Holocaust. Could this kind of ideology cover everything? And then there's another element, and I'm being very rapid here, I'm throwing ideas essentially rather than giving you a formal lecture. What happens when identities are pursued to the hilt? When each group, each ethnic, religious, or identity group finally manages to get its story fully in the press, fully in the national consciousness? Does this mean then that it breaks up the greater unity, or that it belongs to a newly constructed greater unity. And this is something that most societies, and not just you in Russia, but certainly more and even more in the West, in America, and in Western Europe, have not quite resolved yet. When you break down identities to the point where it is his identity, her identity, my ethnic group, your ethnic group, my religion, your religion, is this going back to the bottom to clean the wound, to rebuild together, or does this create separate paths 
that remain separate in ongoing battles that we consider today to be the identity battles in the Western uh, world. These are issues that are hard to come to terms with. Commemoration opens roads of cleansing and it can also create new poisons. Does it, in a sense, cool down the temperature or does it kindle again new passions with new fires? And who creates this agenda? And what happens when commemoration from below might be in clash with the desire to commemorate from above? Let me give you an example coming out of German history, which of course Germany had to confront, United Germany I'm saying after. The 50th anniversary of Hitler's coming to power, there were still two Germanys. The 60th, there were no longer two Germanys. The 50th and the 30th and the 40th anniversaries, then the Holocaust, everything comes together. At a point, a German movement is to say, well, we shall use Kate Kollwitz's Pieta, which is, of course, on Unter den Linden, for those of you who know Berlin. Why don't we use that as the universal symbol of a new concept of all the victims, of all the wars, of fascism, of Nazism, and you name it. There was an uproar among the Jews in the world saying, wait a minute, our victimhood is not quite the same victimhood of the SS soldier who died in the Nazi war. Besides, the symbol of the Pieta is the ultimate Christian symbol. Can we really be put in it? And there was then that what led to the great monument of the murdered Jews of Europe right next to the Tiergarten in Berlin. But this is something that has to be explained. How far do you create non-universal victims to go up again into a better understood universalism and how far does this create separate narratives? Is there a difference, and this will be really almost my last point, is there a difference between pluralist democratic commemoration and authoritarian commemoration? Can we say that in the democratic public sphere you have the kinds of debate I just mentioned in Berlin, and that perhaps in an authoritarian context the same debates take place behind closed doors and you don't really know what is happening? I don't know. Is it, and does it count in terms of the victims in the long run, and also history's onward march. What happens when you commemorate the victims? Are you giving them credit and a place in history when they're no longer dangerous? This is another question. The French have finally created memorials for the Vendée and the suffering in Western France. But did they do so because everyone had become a proper calm citizen of the French Republic? And only then did they create the memorial? Did they wait for the hatreds and the blood to stop to create the memorial? So that maybe you commemorate when it's safe to do so and not before. Can we say that all of Europe started rethinking the Jews because there were so many few Jews left in Europe that it didn't matter anymore because they were mainly in America or in Israel? It's a question which means that then commemoration is a useful ploy or detail that doesn't count as much as people assume it does. Does it contain real polyphonies or not? Is it future-oriented? Unclear. It can often be simply, well, okay, bury the past and that's that. Final issue, when do commemorations become sterile? Ah, you do them because you have to, especially in the Russian case, you were obliged. But you didn't really think about them, you paraded because you had to. It was less the case in the Western European context. But still, ah, yet again. And nowadays it is quite interesting that many people refer to Holocaust fatigue. Oh, not again, we know, but the world has moved on, etc., and etc. And when they become sterile, can they be revived at some point or not? Again, it is an open question. Will they be? Perhaps not, because if we were to commemorate every horror that 
took place in the history of humanity, we would have no time in which to live. Do moments of history withdraw and then fall off? Or do they go through this Mobius strip of a cycle and take on a new, completely different meaning and reference? This is unclear. We are very historical, very, uh, shall we say, journalistic, very immediate notion of following events. It was not the case in the past. So it's not clear how much of all of this noise about the past will really endure, or whether there's almost a biological, inexorable, historical unfolding that will put things back into the past where they will stay as the purview of archivists and historians and others who would be you know, specialists of the past rather than people who have been hurt by the past. And from that point of view, it is a very, very complex moment to define. Because there are world historical events. When I say that the French Revolution ended in 1991, 1989, two years before, there was the bicentennial. Commissions were set up. Everybody had an opinion. Everybody had ideas. But in reality, no one cared anymore. And that was what was most interesting, was that the motor of the tensions had finally become frozen for the French Revolution. But final element that I wish to end is, do historical events have children? Of course, the French Revolution had the Russian Revolution for the real left. They considered the Russian Revolution to be the daughter of the French Revolution. But that's not what I mean. I mean, do events have children? And for instance, in the case of France today, it's no longer the revolution that counts. But it is the 1905 separation of the state from the religion that led to the new cult starting in 18, it had begun already in the mid 19th century, but then it had been lost and returned finally in 1905, the separation of church and state. And this notion, very French notion of the laïcité, which is a child of the original revolution, has become the burning issue of today's French politics and society. So it is no longer the French revolution that matters, but one of its children, that really came to power only 115 years after the French Revolution. That is the burning issue of today. Finally, Benedetto Croce, the great Italian philosopher and historian, always said, as a historicist, that the questions one asks of the past are the questions that are linked to today's present and to the future, immediate future of those who ask the questions. And to change entirely from a country to another, from a I will end with the United States for a second, which is outside these great world historical events, uh, such as the Holocaust, the French Revolution, or the Russian Revolution. Still, ever since the election of Donald Trump, there has been now a massive looking backward into parts of American history that when I was studying and when I was you know, a young adult were considered to be irrelevant. And I'm giving you one example. How did the Ku Klux Klan, created after the Civil War in the southern states against the rights of blacks who had become freed, no longer slaves, migrate to the north? And what role did it have? And what kind of racism did it bring about? What kind of horror and negativism did it produce? How was it linked to the famous great film, The Birth of a Nation? which came out in 1915. What is the link? These, are not, these were not questions that were raised. Now there are burning issues in the United States precisely because of Trump's America and the coming out of forgotten horrors that are now becoming relevant again. So it is a massive spiral. It is a very complex use and counter use of elements. And this is what I try to convey to you, that forgetting, remembering, and commemorating do not have a particular order. They come and go, they repeat themselves, until perhaps one day they're laid to rest because 
X years, decades, or centuries have come, and we do not sit in front of the old events, because that is when the artists take over, paint, write operas, sing, or create music about them. Thank you.